says that we should take two loads, one heavy and one light, and connect them with a the string. Then we should uh, put the string over a horizontal rod and lift up the heavy weight by pulling down the light weight. And then we release the light weight, and we see that the light weight actually sweeps around the rod, and the heavy weight doesn't fall to the ground, as you might expect. So uh, we have to investigate, of course, this phenomenon. So now first we have to understand how can a lightweight, which is in this case about 10 times smaller than the heavy one, stop the heavy one from falling to the ground. And it is because the way friction works when a string is wound around the rod. So we have an equation for the tension on one side and on the other side. If we have the string wound around the rod, so many will take up. But we can see that we have an exponential relationship. So for example, if we take some very uh, modest factor of friction of 0 0.2 and 5, turns around uh, the rod, we can amplify the force by 535 times. So we can have an extremely small weight holding an extremely big one on the other side. Uh, so now, uh, in order to take a look at the movements of the weights, we have to, of course, examine the forces acting on them. So on each weight, we have the tension of the string, of the string from that side, and also the um, weight of each uh, weight. So uh, here I'm using some approximations. The first one is that the rod is very thin, which in turn means that the tension will be acting towards the center of the rod on the small weight, which in reality isn't quite true. And also I'm considering the small weight the point mass. Uh, and from that we can uh, have uh, created these two equations of motion with the friction forces, and then we substitute for the friction and uh, expand this vector derivative, we end up with these two differential equations. So we can see that uh, we have accelerations uh, of the small weight, the uh, normal acceleration, the angular acceleration. And we can see that they depend on the derivatives of themselves. And also, uh, we have some exponential terms with the angle over here. And basically, these equations are very complicated and it's impossible to solve analytically. So what I did is I created a computer simulation that will simulate the movement of the small weight. And the way it works is, uh, it takes the speed, angular velocity, and position. So first you set the starting conditions. And then it plugs them into those equations and calculates the acceleration and the angular acceleration of the small weight. It then moves the small weight with those velocities by some very small step and repeats the whole process. Of course, it saves all the data, the acceleration, the velocity, the positions, and everything. So later it can generate, for example, this kind of graph, which in this case shows just the path of the small weight, weight through space. So the parameters I considered, the one I mentioned was the falling distance of the large weight, because I think it uh, shows very nicely how effective the, these parameters of the experimental system were at stopping the large weight. The smaller the distance that it falls, the more effective the parameters were. So I measured the, I changed the starting distance of the small weight and the starting angle of the small weight, and I also uh, measured the path that the small weight took. So. My hypothesis is the first one is that the theory will be in better agreement with the experiment at larger distances of the small weight from the uh, rod. Why? Because I took the approximation that the tension of the string acts toward, toward the center of the rod. And we can see that if the small weight is further from the rod, the actual tension is much closer to the uh, one that I assume to be. And if it is clo uh, closer to the rod, the deviation from the theory will then be much larger because of the approximation. My second hypothesis is that the falling distance of the large weight will be in a linear relationship with the, falling with the starting distance of the small weight. Uh, because if we just put the small weight closer, it is approximately the same part from the dimensions of the rod as if we made the whole experimental setup smaller. So we are expecting all the distances uh, to just decrease, for example, twice if we put the small weight two times closer. So I'm, I'm expecting the linear relationship between those two magnitudes. So this is the experimental setup that I use. I use two fishing weights because they are small, quite dense, and easily easy to get in a variety of different masses. There were five grams and 60 grams. Uh, I used a string that was uh, 1.1 meters thick and very non-stretchy. And also I used a steel rod of the diameter four millimeters. Uh, it was attached to a big white board, which also had a protractor to measure the angle on the board. So the first experiment I did was changing the distance of the small weight from the rod. Uh, it was from 20 to 90 centimeters in 10 centimeter steps. And I had markings on the string, uh, which I used to measure. 
uh, I took five measurements for each uh, height, and all of the measurements were done at a constant angle of 50 degrees. Uh, then I changed the angle of the small weight uh, from 20 to 90 degrees in, in 10 degree steps, and I measured it with the protractor that you saw on the experimental setup. Also five measurements, and everyone, everything was done at a constant distance of 80 centimeters of the small weight from the body. So now uh, the, repeat the repeatability of the results. Uh, the following distance was very precise, so I had less than half percent of standard deviation for all the measurements. Uh, however, for some measurements, the small weight would collide with the string from the big weight, and it would lose energy or wind itself around the string. But those measurements I didn't take into account. Instead, I repeated the measurements. So here you can see a graph. We have starting distance of the small weight on the x-axis and form distance of the large weight on the y-axis. And the blue points are the measured results. And you can see they fit a linear line perfectly, which also goes through the origin, which is exactly uh, what I expect <coughs> for my first hypothesis. And this uh, red line is a theoretical expectation. And you can see that the theory makes very good predictions at large distances. But as the distance goes down, the theory starts deviating more from the experiment. So just the way I thought, the approximations have much less effect at larger distances. So now, uh, here is, we have again uh, the following distance uh, of the large weight on the y-axis and the starting angle uh, on the x-axis. And uh, what we can see is again that we have very good correlation between the theory which is obtained by the computer simulation and the experimental we obtain points. Uh, the deviation is larger from the theory on larger angles. Now, uh, this indirectly actually confirms again the first hypothesis. Because on the larger angles, uh, the um, uh, the weight actually f uh, or excuse me, on smaller angles the deviation is higher. On larger angles it is smaller because if the angle is smaller, uh, the small weight will be able to stop the big weight later. So while it is uh, spinning around the rod, it will actually again be closer to the rod. And we know that when it is closer, the approximations take more effect, and we have higher deviations from the theory. And also we can see that. Uh, for the larger angle, uh, we have smaller falling distances across the measured range. And also, the theory predicts this kind of small maximum over here, but it was not observed experimentally. So now, I also wanted to take a look at the path of the small weight, but I had some problems because uh, I wanted to record it with a slow motion camera, but the fastest I could do was 100 FPS, which is not quite fast enough. And also, I had uh, some problems that were bigger than that, which was with exposure. Basically, the camera I had, I couldn't adjust exposure, so on every frame, the path was blurry, and I couldn't exactly determine the position of the small weight. So what I did was I used an Arduino and some electronic components to create a stroboscope. It basically flashes very short pulses of light at the same frame as the camera, and that, in effect, shortens the exposition and just freezes the weight in exactly one moment. Uh, I uh, measure the path for 50 centimeters starting distance and 50 degrees starting angle of the small weight. And for the analysis of and the tracking of the small weight, I used tracker. So here, uh, there should be a video, but for some reason it doesn't work. Uh, anyway, this is the. It's a video of uh, the. The path of the small around. weight. Uh, as you showed in the demonstration. So here you can see uh, the path, the red one is the theoretical expectations, and the blue one is the measured values. Now the uh, measurements are only taken at these blue points, and they're just connected with lines because otherwise it would be very cluttered. Um, and we can see that uh, it fits very well with the experimental predictions. However, more interesting maybe is this graph. So on this graph we can see the distance from the small weight to the rod versus time. And we can see that uh, while the small weight is still far from the rod, the theory makes good predictions. But then uh, this part of the graph is then just the small weight wrapping around the rod once the big weight is already stopped. And we can see that the, rep, the theory predicts that it will happen much faster than it actually happens. And also, uh, I will further explain that, but there is a um, very interesting thing happening here, which is that the small weight actually pulls the big weight back up at one moment during the experiment, during the experiment, which means that actually friction is not crucial for stopping the large weight. The small weight can even pull it back, but it is crucial for holding it once it is stopped and once all both weights stop moving. So now, 
why uh, do does the theory predict much faster wrapping than it's, it's actually observed? Well, if we take a look at the force mm -hmm. diagram, while the small weight is wrapping around the rod. So in theory, I am taking as if all of the tension is acting towards the center. So there's this blue uh, arrow right here. But in actuality, it is acting, um, it's acting tangent to the rod. And that means that there is a component of the tension which is actually slowing down uh, the small weight and making it wrap much more slowly than it would theoretically, especially as it comes closer to the rod because again, the experimental errors become more pronounced. So in conclusion, uh, both my hypotheses were proven true. The theory has agreed better with the experiment at larger distances. And the falling distance of the large weight was perfectly in a perfectly linear relationship with the starting distance of the small weight. So the, these differential equations for the theoretical model made correct predictions for all of the angle tested, uh, but bad predictions for higher angles were better. And also we made correct predictions for larger distances of the small weight from the center, less than 5% from 40 centimeters and onwards larger. So now about the path, the theoretical model made very good predictions about the actual path in space, the coordinates of the, that the small weight will follow, but it made worse predictions uh, for the time dependence because of the approximation that the force will act exactly towards the center of the uh, rod. This is the literature that I have used, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. Questions from the floor? Okay, so firstly, have you considered the transition of friction? Which you have you considered the difference between the static friction and kinetic Yes, friction? yes, I have. Is it included? Uh, in the simulations, it is included. Okay. So have you considered the elasticity of the string? No. No, you have not. Okay. So have, so as you say, you only consider it when the line load did not collide with the string, right? Yes, that is correct. Okay. So another part. Does your rod move while you're doing an experiment? No. It's very stable. Yes. Okay. So next part. Does the string always coil on the rod, or is sometimes coil on the string? Uh, what do you mean? Does the string connecting the line load always coil on the rod? Instead of string. Uh, like rods around the string. Does the string overlap? Uh, yes, sometimes it can overlap. <coughs> <coughs> Have you calculated the friction on the string? Well, if it's overlapping. Do you think it make a difference? No, I haven't. Okay, so how many degrees of freedom are there in your, in your system? Um, what do you mean, how many degrees of freedom? Yes, there is two dimensional, right? Yes. Okay. If you show me a graph that, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we show me a graph about the uh, on page, page six. Oh, sorry, it's not as much. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. Oh, we okay. this one. So, this one? so do you, can you explain why this? This this thing like crosses on the left on the right. Uh, what what do you mean? Which which crosses? Okay, so it's could you explain the variation? No, that's just like what, which is why is this smaller not bigger? Well, um, so why is the, the you mean the why, the why uh, the theory predicts smaller? Why is thank you.
they asked, but they have not given us a clear uh, qualitative explanation for the reason for the phenomenon clearly, and they does not show how the friction was calculated, and they does not qualify the assumption, like also the tension to the rod and mass is the point mass. They have not qualified this into a specific point, and they have not given us the original theoretical equation, uh, which is unclear, and they have not talked about the physics behind all the effect of parameters, which is the main behind the parameters. And they have not shown um, clear transition of the difference between the static and kinetic friction. And they have not like, talked about the differences between the fell or the double drop, which they have mentioned in their observations. But, uh, but also, the, I have to say that they have done a good part on actually explaining the errors and deviation from their theory. But in overall, I believe in general, this test fulfillment from reporter is quality fulfilled. So here are several points that I would like to discuss in the next week. Firstly, uh, the friction, since the friction exists in the phenomena, I'd like to firstly talk about the formal friction in the system, and including a centripetal force, and also a centripetal force inside, and also the transition between the kinetic and static friction, and also string coding, which would make backing the friction. And next part, since the, the reporters say that it only consider the case while the the string does not collide with the light load, so I believe that this record that they have added an additional Z component of motion which causes a difference in the direction of tension and which I believe will also potentially affect the coil pattern of the string. And next part, I would like to have some discussion on theory assumption, including the theory limit, which the report has not done a specific explanation of it, including the total mass and the elasticity. And I'd like to talk, also talk about the boundaries of whether the phenomenon will happen or not. And in another part, I'd like to further have some discussion on the parameters, including the initial condition with the ended releasing angle and starting length, and the radius of rod, which I believe would affect the length of the coil strings, which affect the trajectory of the line load, and the mass ratio, which I believe would have a critical relationship with the phenomenon, and that's the string material, which is not very uh, fairly discussed in the reports to the court. And this began my presentation. So we'll do the next phase. I cannot see the time, but I guess we can. Sorry. Okay, thank you. So, can you first tell me um, how do you differentiate the difference between static, for, static friction and kinetic friction? <coughs> uh, you mean how I made it? Uh, yes, so first. Oh, okay, so for the kinetic friction, I. Um, yeah, uh, so I wrapped. Uh, I wrapped the uh, three <coughs> times around the rod, and then I measured the speed of falling, and from that I can calculate the friction. So that's right. As you say that while the poles are at the mouth are in motion, you mm -hmm. have observed that time when the line of poles are the heavy Yes. Right. right. So which means that originally it was the heavy of falling in the line, and then it become the line. So there would be a transition of the stopping. Yes. Well, it's stopped. So that time the friction involved should be stated, right? Yes. Then have you have you considered it in the new model? Because the transition of this it won't be very very clear. Uh, yes, I have considered it in my model. So in my computer simulation, every time the speed of the weights uh, of the large weight uh, goes to zero, which means that the string is also static relative to the rod, the friction switches to static, and then if the force by the small or the big weight uh, becomes larger than the static friction, then it starts moving and it switches back to the end. So, another part. So, as you put it, uh, you've considered the tension here to be yes. pointing on the middle. Correct. Then, then, have you considered the work found by the tension? Because since the line of trajectory seems to be like in this direction, which is not perpendicular to the tension, have you considered? Uh, yes, yes, it is considered. I mean, uh, in my simulation, the tension acts towards the center of the string and the work that the tension does because the trajectory is not perpendicular to the tension is considered, but for the tension acting towards the center. Okay, okay I believe that's good. And how about the color? Have you? Um, okay. So mainly the friction will be affected by the coil. Right? Right. Yes. So, so let me preliminary ask the question. What do you think the main cause of stopping the heavy load? So I think the main cause of stopping the heavy load is the centrifugal force from the light load. So uh, all the part because I believe that while actually it's stuck, it's still not fall, right? It will call you up till the end. Yes. So what I believe is that let me consider that it might be the friction, the 
friction at host, as you say, and that it should be on the board that stops it. Well, I believe, so in my experimental setup, the value for the coefficient of friction was 0 0.142, which is, in this case, quite small. So let's turn back to the centripetal okay. force here. So why do you think the centripetal force, since it's acting on the point in the middle, why do you think it won't just form the circular motion? Well, because uh, the string is wrapping around the rod, so the string gets shortened. Because the the motion. Motion. Because since the heavy belt this also has a bigger freedom here. Yes. So why do you think uh, the heavy belt was just able to adjust it and allow it to do a circular motion? Uh, 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 so what do you think that caused the curve to be working on this trajectory? Well, I mean, so once the heavy load, uh, so once the first the small right, so load. I'll let you okay. So how about we? You say you the, the you only take the experimental data which the LIGO was the LIGO string, right? Yes. So. Does you like, oh, let's look at it from the other side. So have you like avoided it to construct it so that it won't hit the rod? Well, I believe if you don't hit the rod, it must be N to C component. Uh, um, yes. So that will be causing a different phenomenon, which potentially feels like you got a tension in this direction, which might be coiled in this way or coiled in this way. And even more, if the coil, the, the direction has at another angle, which should be changing the radius a lot. Have you considered that? Um, so I I agree that there has to be a z component uh, in the tension, but the small weight was maybe a centimeter to the side, and the overall length of the string was a meter. So I think it is. Uh, have you tried to analyze the difference? Uh, no, I have not tried to analyze the difference. Okay, so I believe that could potentially be negligible, but I believe you should not like it. Okay. So let's move on to the another part about the theory of assumption. So okay. you say that. Um, qualitatively a difference, like for example, total mass. Um, mm -hmm. The mass distribution will affect the phenomenon. So do you think that is there any limits, like for example, total mass, when they're too far together, are too light, that it won't affect the that, that we won't have the uh, Yes, because so I for these weights that I had, the string weight was negligible. And when the weight gets so, loud, so light that the string is actually has a considerable part of the weight, I think the phenomenon could not appear. So do you think that how, uh, so, do you, so do you mean that in a small scale, we have to consider the string inside? Yes. So do you think yes. what is the limit? So under what, what's, under what number of the total mass is considered? Under five grams of total Yes. Okay, so how about elasticity? Because I believe that while you're both are doing the motion, while doing the motion, elasticity would also affect the trajectory. Uh, yes, I agree with you. So, so do you think it will affect your trajectory? You know, since you face your your you know, numerical method based on the radius, right? And if elastic, elasticity is involved in the motion, that will also affect the radius. Uh, yes, I agree with you, but the string I used was very non-elastic. Uh, I, I tried to, I mean, I tested uh, the elasticity. So you have tested the elasticity? Not, not quantitatively, but I have tested it, and while pulling on it with about, say, 10 kilograms of force, it stretched by a couple of millimeters. So I think it is really negative. So that's why I go to your graphs. So first thing on page six. Yeah, okay. So I believe the, you've done a very great work on comparing the numerical method, but can you explain that there's an intersection there, right? Yes, that is, uh, certainly. That is because the small weight uh, actually pulls back the large weight, so the rate distance between the small weight and the rod increases. So, so then it crosses where it passed previously. So can, is there any cases that does it always pull up, or there's sometimes it won't? Uh, so th there are some times where it doesn't pull up. For example, I conducted some simulations with larger coefficients of friction, okay. and it is possible that the small weight in that case doesn't pull up the large weight. Okay, that's very good. So why would you think that going forward, you mean it's only mainly on the measure of friction? Mm -hmm. Or do you think the gravity or the mass ratio is looking down and for falling back? Uh, for pulling, uh, I think both are important. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So let's move, move up to the another graph, which is on page 40, under the theory of comparison over the theory of prediction. So you say in your presentation, you think you've got a zero zero on um, your experiment. Mm -hmm. Then why don't why why is your theoretical expectation does not? Uh, because it seems that you have a more yes. deviation from it. Uh, because the uh, again, the same approximation that the tension is acting towards the center of the rod. Because in reality, the tension will just, if I can just speak for this a bit tidier. Uh, so in reality, the tension acts, of course, this way, and not this way. So there is a component kind of pulling it back here, and everything, so the, the small weight will actually be moving more slowly, and it will stop the big weight later in reality than the theory predicts. Okay, I believe I have agreed with that. Can go to another, uh, go to the graphs on your parameters? So, first we uh, can go uh, like this. One of the first on the graph. Um, this one. So, what do you think? Why do you have a larger side angle? You have a long falling distance? Uh, well, I think uh, because it simply takes more time for the small weight to start wrapping around the rod because it was such so a large So, that's angle. the part I would ask. Because you use the falling distance inside your model, then do you think the scaling factor would affect the falling distance? Because if we just times up everything into a double size? Yes, then the falling distance will be double. That is my, that's so why I expect this thing here. So maybe I think you could, like, reducing your falling distance with the generalized form, which dimensionless, and all that, it will be easier for you to discuss. And can you explain the, the variation there? Uh, yes, again, same approximation. So uh, when the angle is smaller, the smaller uh, ball star stop, uh, gets closer to the rod before stopping the big one, which means that, again, we have a larger effect of the same approximation. So you're saying this still of, of the approximation? Yes, I think that's I believe this approximation obviously has given you a lot of problems. So maybe you can include yes. it and another one just to make it into a small. So, what, so, do you, so you think this is the main factor here? I think okay. the main source of error between the theory and experiment is that. So, okay, so maybe, and do you have the error bar in your graph or is it too small? To uh, it's just too small to do. Okay, okay, so can I have the next graph regarding parameters? Uh, this one? Oh, yeah, so can you tell me that there's obviously some deviation from your theoretical expectation measure? That is because since I think you are not <laughs> considerably air resistance, right? Oh, I think also has the air resistance. Yeah, so I think, do you think that it's the air resistance that causes PDs? Uh, I doubt it, no. I think the air resistance is small. I think the, the, those are some errors in tracking the path. Okay, so I believe that is why that okay. you should investigate resistance. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Summary of the opponent, one minute. So in the discussion, we have asked the um, reporter to clarify our centripetal force. And I believe that the centripetal force here should be only used for the secondary motion, which the, I believe the reporter should conduct more clarification or investigation on why would the line be eventually pulled toward the rod, which has the smaller distance with the rod. And we have discussed about the position between kinetic and static friction and the street coiling on the permanent. And I believe that it's also unclear that the reporter tell us how to differentiate these two types, two types of friction. And the 3D motion, I agree with the reporter that this 3D motion might be negligible, but I also believe that the reporter should come out more investigation on convincing us that this is really negligible because things that the difference between it could affect the phenomenon by the tension and also friction a lot. And in the theory assumption that I believe, the theory assumption, the two assumption from the reporter effect it gives the reporter a lot of errors inside the experiment. And for the parameters, I believe that you should determine the condition of the two drops, which makes a difference. Oh, and the okay. level of string cannot be, should be normalized. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you to the report as well as the reporter for discussion and report. And my first question to the reporter, what types of friction do you have in your system? Uh, I have static and dynamic dry friction. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, how was the static friction determined? Uh, the static friction was determined by wrapping the small weight around the rod <coughs> until it could hold the big weight and then pulling uh, using a dynamometer on the big okay, weight until it started static. Okay, thank you. And how often did you repeat it? Uh, five times. Okay, uh, to, to the opponent, do you think that the determination of both friction coefficients is sufficient? 
So I believe the catalytic friction should be uh, decreasing all the way. Because okay, thank you very much, thank you. And um, to, your, uh, to your reporter, did you vary the diameter of your watch? No. And um, does the friction depend on the diameter of the watch? No. Opponent, do you agree? Uh, I believe you affect the motion and then affect the friction. But, but not directly. So the di diameter of the watch uh, um, <coughs> affects the friction? Yes. Okay, I disagree to this point. Um, could you please go to... Okay, you're on, already on slide 18. Um, why does the theory start earlier than the experiment here? Uh, because um, before this, I had some problems in tracking simply. The weight was let go from here, but I only had the data of this path from here. Okay, because opponent, do you then think that this is a valid comparison between theory and experiment? No, I believe because they have not considered the resistance and errors. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, so, uh, to be reporter, why do you believe that there's a deviation from theory as well as experiment, especially in the beginning where you have the sliding, fr sliding friction? Uh, uh, this deviation, I believe, is just due to errors in tracking the small weight. So just from tracking errors? Yes, I believe so. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you go to slide 13, please? Uh, so, uh, okay, maybe it's one slide. Um, uh, you stated in your presentation um, that uh, the mass can sometimes collide. Is that correct? Uh, the small mass collides, with, or the string of the small mass collides with the string of the big. Not. not but the mass they themselves do not collide. The mass themselves do not. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you go to slide eleven, please? Um, okay. And maybe where you showed the different masses. Uh, here? Oh yeah, it's, uh, exactly. Um, where the masses, uh, how, okay, so the masses were fixed to the screen, <coughs> and were they able to rotate? No, uh, the big mass was able to rotate. The small mass. And do you think that this has an influence on the phenomenon? No. Opponent, do you agree to that? I believe you potentially affect the string and affect the friction. So if it, the heavy mass is rotating. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. And to the reporter, did you vary your mass ratio? No. Okay, and what do you believe would change if you have, for example, a higher mass ratio compared to a lower mass ratio? Uh, I think it is hard to say exactly, but for two high mass ratios, I think the phenomenon will no longer work. Okay, uh, opponent, do you believe this is an important parameter? Oh, sorry. Do you believe that the mass ratio is an important parameter? Yes, I believe it's a. Okay, I agree to you. And um, to the reporter, do you think that absolute mass has an, uh, plays a role in the phenomenon? Uh, no, apart from, for example, the elasticity of the string and things like that. So if the mass could be infinitesimally high, and the phenomenon will still occur. I mean, as long as, for example, the string mass is negligible... So there's no limit to the uh, mass? No, I believe not. Okay, I disagree to this point. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Harry Hennig, and today I'm going to be with you on top number 14, Moving Painting Moment. So firstly, to the report, on, to, uh, what we quite like about the report is that it did a live demonstration of the, no of the phenomenon, so we, so we were able to get a grasp of, of how the phenomenon actually works. Then he tried to model the phenomenon uh, theoretically uh, and even compared um, the trajectory of his um, uh, theory as well as his experiment. However, there were some doubtful results in the trajectory where the theory would start earlier than the experiment, and there were also were some deviations in the beginning due to um, some different um, friction types, in my opinion. Then he discovered the stick and slip mechanism, so something where the uh, heavy mass can stuck at a certain point, but then it's pulled up a bit um, by, the light, by the light mass, which was quite nice because it's uh, completely new to the uh, entire phenomenon. However, the pendulum was released by the hand, um, and uh, yeah, which is uh, maybe not that reproducible. And um, also, there was an unclear difference of sliding versus static friction because the water curve went, which was also criticized by the opponent, which we quite like. Then, there were some crucial missing parameters like the mass ratio or the water diameter, which have, in my opinion, a high, high influence on the entire phenomenon. And I even asked for the absolute mass, however, he uh, responded um, that this uh, doesn't really have an influence, which is uh, in some um, um, regions correct. However, I think if the mass, if mass gets too high, there is definitely uh, um, a difference in, uh, in, if, if we um, take a look at the absolute mass. Then, there was also no, um, um, no good um, determination of the um, uh, different friction coefficients, where he just stated that he um, referred it around um, three times, and then did the measurement five times. And I definitely think that he should have, uh, should have wrapped it around um, different amounts, or um, he wrapped it around two times or five times, uh, which was, would have been better if we get um, a different comparison uh, for the friction coefficient, because I think that the friction is the most important parameter of this entire phenomenon. Uh, and um, I also believe that the deviations on step 18 are especially from um, the um, bad determination of the friction coefficients. Um, now let's come to the opponent. The opponent asked for a difference of static and sliding uh, friction, um, so which occurred when, which we quite like. Then uh, he asked, also asked for a de determination of the friction coefficients, because this is crucial, and uh, what we mentioned in the report, uh, how they were determined. He also asked for a mass ratio or water diameter, which is quite good. However, what we didn't like is and that the uh, opponent stated that the um, friction is dependent on the diameter, which it definitely is, in my opinion. Then he also asked for different phases, so when the different um, coefficients uh, occur. 
and also um, of the overlapping of the string. If this um, change friction, so the string will kind of stay up, which is also quite good. Um, then this is actually more right here should be a good point. And um, however, there was no really clarification of the experimental setup, how um, why the scope of code should be better than a camera, and um, of the releasing mechanism, so how it was released. And uh, also no discussion that the tension acts toward the center of the rod and not uh, along the string, which uh, would, um, would, make, would make a difference, especially in the theoretical um, results. And he said it um, too less of his own opinion and even a more opinion in the clarifying questions. Okay, so now let's come to the, um, the, the key question. First was the difference between the static and the sliding friction, where the reporter stated that there was a change from static to sliding and then to static friction again. And that the reporter, in our opinion, didn't really present a clear opinion. And we definitely agree to the reporter that this thing is slips so when the heavy mass moves um, two times, it causes a transition between the different friction types. And then we, um, they talked about the reason for their assuming about what so why this phenomenon actually occurs, and where the um, reporter did um, not really present a sufficient opinion, and uh, said that the semi food report uh, has only a minor influence, and the opponent criticized, uh, but did not really bring his own statement, and only stated that the component of the semi food report in the what um, direction affects the phenomenon. Uh, in our opinion, it is quite intuitively explainable by the conservation of annual momentum in some parts, uh, where the um, light mass just accelerates faster, and we agree to report that the set component of the centrifugal force is uh, irrelevant, and the phenomenon does not need to be uh, modeled in three, three dimensions. And now, uh, also, the influence of the absolute mass, where the uh, opponent said that the elasticity becomes important, and the uh, reporter said that for small uh, masses, the swing uh, mass becomes significant, and we say that both are right, and for the limiting case, um, but uh, it, uh, it only takes uh, um, quite for small masses and the limits are relevant for um, the normal conditions of the reporter. So um, this uh, was my review, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. All the questions. And now, final or concluding remarks of the... Okay, so first of all, I would like to take both the opponent and the reviewer uh, for a great position and review. Uh, so now for some uh, points uh, said by the reviewer. So first of all, uh, this deviation between the theory and the experiment, the reporter, uh, the reviewer said it, that he thinks it was because of static friction, but I find it hard to believe because you can see that the path of the small weight uh, is not uh, regular. So there are some sudden turns here, it's almost straight. And I find it hard to believe that this is the normal path of the string. I think these are tracking errors because you would expect a smoother path. And also the uh, reviewer said that I, he thinks I measured the uh, coefficients of friction insufficiently well, but I disagree. I think my method was good enough, and uh, I don't think there are, that's, uh, that is the main source of the errors in my theory. And also for the ratio of masses, uh, the, uh, I agree that the absolute mass would have an effect if it was very high or very low. I stated during the clarifying questions that it wouldn't have an effect as long as it is negligible, for example, uh, in relation to the mass of the string, and the string elasticity uh, growth goes, of course, coming to effect if the masses are very large. So I, uh, it is negligible within the um, within the range uh, where these assumptions hold. Uh, that's it for important remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Two questions of the jury in the next five minutes. Any yeah. pull up slide 14, please? <coughs> um, um, can we come back to the question once sure. we resolve that? Just Maybe okay. I Okay. 14. Okay, I'll try to make it quick. You said that you expected your theoretical expectation um, the falling distance should be linearly related to the starting distance. Yes. You also said that you expected your data points to be linear. Yes. Fine. And you expected them to agree when you got up to higher values. Those straight lines after 90 centimeters are going to start to diverge. Yes, I agree. Right? Um, what do you expect your data to happen after you go past 90 centimeters? Uh, my data, uh, I think my data will uh, also start, so uh, the data will start going uh, upwards, I believe, after it's very small distances. So after you get up over to the right of that graph, if we extended those lines out, you expect your data oh, then to, to the right of the graph to, to here. higher than 90 centimeters? Oh, uh, I expect my data points to remain linear. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Vashkevich. Uh, yes, uh, to the reviewer, you said that a lar very large absolute mass will introduce new physics to this. Yes. What kind of phenomenon would occur? Uh, I mean, um, some really, really high mass could maybe lead to some bending of the, um, the rod, which would affect the entire trajectory, or maybe even have an um, effect of, uh, of the tension of the spring, which is also stated by the opponent. Yeah, um, so in your slide, actually, can we quickly go back one slide on the review of the slide? Um, <coughs> so you said um, that the sweeping around the rod is intuitively explainable by conservation of angular momentum. Yeah, this is uh, not completely correct. Uh, the angular momentum is not conserved, is, is that what you're asking for? Or? Can you just tell us more about it? So the angular momentum is not conserved. Uh, should I uh, to talk about this, or what should you? Yeah, yeah. What did you mean by that bullet point? Or uh, like it just means that, that, uh, that the light mass accelerates uh, over time and therefore de thereby uh, sweeps the starts to sweep around the watch. Or what are we referring to? Sorry. I think it's okay. Thank you. A question for the reporter. Um, what is the mass ratio you use? Is it only one value? Uh, yes, it is only one value. So why did you not think that it was important to uh, well, I agree that the mass ratio is an important parameter, but I decided to concentrate on changing other parameters. So, but what was roughly? It was, I think, yeah, 12 to 1. 5 grams and 60 grams. So, question for the opponent. Uh, is mass ratio an important parameter? I'm going to do this. Okay, next question, maybe. To the opponent, uh, you asked multiple questions about 3D model of motion, what kind of improved theoretical predictions do you expect from the 3D model? So for example, to prevent, well, so other than preventing the colliding of the string and the light rope, which also, well, it's actually formed a helical coil on the rod, which would make the coil's length for every round different. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have a short question? Uh, you were examining the situation uh, of Fermat over uh, 20 degrees at the starting angle. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Why didn't you go with, let's say, deeper? Uh, so I did it in 10 degree steps, and if I went one step further, which is to 10 degrees, the light, the light mass couldn't stop the bigger one because it uh, collided with the rod. Okay. So it, there was not enough string to wrap around and hold the bigger mass. May I? Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, at this point, I definitely think that the mass ratio should have been very. Okay. Thank you. Maybe the opponent. Some. I don't know. Uh, that's fine. No problem. Then. Thank you. Uh, could you look at a capstan equation? Thirty seconds. Please. So in in here, you are assuming that one. Uh, I mean, one string has bigger tension than the other, so yes. friction x in a certain direction. Uh, yes. So then. Do you account for the fact that because you observe um, the motion of the mass uh, changing? Yes, I do account for the changing of direction of friction. Okay. Yes. So that's included in the theory. It's really cool, right? Yes. I, I was actually, this is the slide really quickly. Um, this capstan equation is is derived assuming that you have a static situation. Uh, not static necessarily. It's it's it is for static and dynamic friction. It is. Okay, time is up for the questions. Thank you very much. And now we need. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start to say the numbers for me. So, first the points for the reporter, please. The 5, 7, 7, 7, and 6. Then now the points for the opponent. For me, 6, 8, 6, 8, 6. And now the scores for the reviewer. 8, 8, 7, 9, and 8. That's a 7. That's a 7. seven. <laughs> okay. Uh, Maybe some explanations of any for the high marks and for the low marks for the reporter. I was the 
bad jury this time. Uh, I gave a five, which is definitely the lowest mark. Um, I really appreciate it that you have understood, understood the basic idea behind the phenomenon. Uh, on the other hand, I was basically missing two, two in, probably important parts that you had uh, maybe a little, quite a little bit oversimplified theoretical model. Uh, because you were basically using numerical analysis, I would have expected, expected at least one more parameter applied into your numerical solution. What could have made obviously the whole solution uh, definitely a bit more accurate, but this was unfortunately one thing. The other thing was that on the other hand, this problem's uh, quite good uh, to make lots of measurements and vary a lot of parameters, such as maybe the most important, uh, one of the most important is mass ratio, because that can, I'm, I'm pretty sure that can, uh, uh, cause quite different solutions, quite different phenomena, quite different motions of the two different bodies. And therefore I said that it was maybe a nice solution, but maybe a little bit under the average because you missed both theoretical and some experimental parts of this problem. Maybe someone for the seven? Um, William? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so so you all solved this differently than we did. And so I appreciated that you had a little different approach. Um, the, I agree with our lead juror that um, I think your model was a little oversimplified, but I thought, I thought your discussion with the opponent was, was really effective. You guys worked well together, you, you talked well, and so that increased your score a little bit. Um, and when I got to the end, I was choosing between a six or a seven. I had gotten a six, and, six and a half. Um, I honestly think your answer to my capstan question is not correct. I, I think that derivation does assume a, a non-slipping a, a non, uh, condition. But you said it with such confidence that I'm willing to give you the benefit of the doubt, and I round it up. Okay. Maybe? So, Thanks, I, just like uh, my colleague here, I was struggling between six and seven. So what pushed me to a seven was the way you communicated. I think this is one of the fights that I've seen that uh, uh, during the discussion, uh, the understanding of physics was increased. Uh, and it was an open and honest discussion, which I really appreciate. Uh, you had a very nice qualitative explanation leading into the theory. Um, what, what you could have done more, I feel, was to go into the details of both the theory and experiment. Because I think, as you said, friction was important. But if it's so important, uh, and you basically showed us how important it was through the exponent, exponential dependence, then why weren't, wasn't the experiments where you uh, characterized the friction coefficients and explanations of how it went into the capstan? Actually, I think he's right. I think the derivation is different slightly for kinetic energy. <coughs> so all these details have to be put in uh, to get you to the next level. And I think you guys uh, could have done it. But overall, well done. Ravish, wanted to say some uh, nice words? Yes. Uh, to, to balance off the things that have been said just before, uh, I agree with the capstan equation for dynamic friction and no der derivation, and it's correct. Uh, in terms of your theoretical model, I really like that you simplified things. Uh, I'm sure we'll see on the grand final someone including air drag in this and claiming that this is the best possible model or whatever. The mathematical elegance of the scaling that you found is something which is completely impossible to do within an overcomplicated model. And we've had way too many of those on, like, from the top teams. So uh, that is refreshing. And I very much agree with the point about the discussion being like, really open and actually answering the questions instead of like, going into heuristic loops. So thanks okay. for that. Thank you. Then to the opponent, low mark, high mark. Rados, maybe a Oh, I'm on the low side. Uh, I feel like when a substantial part of your opposition was concerned with the 3D model, and um, when asked about what kind of new physics does it actually add to this problem, I didn't see sufficient, uh, sufficient argumentation there. 
Like the fact that there is a slight angle to this helical thing, which like effectively just slightly increases the thickness of the rod. I don't really feel like this is something substantially different. Um, if it was like, oh, we have a different regime because we can predict the tangling of the string or something like that, then I feel like then this is something that warrants a more complex model, but just this helical thing is not sufficient. Uh, on the other hand, on the discussion you had uh, an argument about, oh, how come you have a spiral when you have a, a thin rod approximation and static friction? That was very elegant and I like that. Um, okay. Thank you. I think that was uh, an explanation of your mark, maybe a high mark uh, for the opponent. Oh, okay. Thank you, maybe. I, I thought uh, your opening questions were excellent. Uh, it showed you, uh, showed us good and intimate understanding of the physics of the problem. Uh, what raised it to an eight is the kind of discussion you had. So. Uh, it was, I think, systematic and well prioritized, except, I agree, for the point about the third dimension, the Z direction. Uh, if you had um, gone into a bit more of uh, uh, discussion, of, I think I thought friction was the most important, uh, that could have uh, brought you to an even higher uh, score. Uh, I think you were sidetracked a bit. You asked about friction, and then they talked about something Related, but you didn't get back to your original question. Um, but overall, it was uh, systematic and uh, well discussed. Okay, then maybe jump to the reviewer. The scores were basically the same, with very small deviation. If someone would like to say some words. Yeah, I would like to. Um, so, actually, something that I noticed uh, for all three teams is that um, the actual mechanism of the looping itself wasn't really discussed. So I would have really liked energy considerations or more force diagrams or angular momentum considerations. And that's why I invited you to just tell us more. It was an open question, actually. I wasn't asking for a specific answer, just a general discussion. And that was something that I was actually a bit disappointed about, that you didn't develop that further. Um, both feedback for the opposition and the reviewer, both of you pointed out in your slides that the um, reporter hadn't gone into these instinctive explanations of, of just what is the phenomenon. But then I th felt that you didn't hammer that home. I felt that both of you guys just picked on one or two kind of small niche criticisms that I felt were less relevant when actually you could have just been like, okay, why does it loop? They didn't discuss that. And actually the, the discussion moment could have been an opportunity to, to bring that up. That I, and that was something that I really wanted to see. But in general, I mean, I gave it a seven. Um, you did point out many good things um, that I also noticed. And I thought your, the questions phase was particularly um, good use of time for you. OK, maybe someone else too? I actually thought um, your, questioning, your questioning of both teams is, is the best set of questions on a problem I've seen in a long time. You guys, you guys did a right, nice job. Thank you. Um, you actually did a very nice job of prioritizing your questions, you know, working your way from um, you know, what you thought was most important down to um, you know, stuff that would, was less important. And, and so, so that was really good. And, and so that started off well for you. Um, in my mind, you, you developed so many questions you know, as you were going along, you kind of set yourself up for a review to race through. Right? Like you were, you know, it was, uh, um, and so I was vacillating between an eight and a nine, but I didn't want to hold you, I hold against you for having done such a good job of, of kind of setting the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we need a break so we can start.